All right, welcome back. We're in for our last half day here um, to begin the afternoon. So we have a, a few presentations, and then once again, uh, we get the rapid fire uh, lightning talks. Um, so get ready. There's a lot coming at you in the next hour, uh, two hours. Um, to start us off, I'm very happy to welcome Julian Ramey to discuss or to present on the loud social fabrics of AAA. Hi everyone, thank you Josh. Uh, yes, my name is Jen Remy. I'm a PhD candidate in digital humanities at the University of Basel. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my, what I'm doing in my PhD and some of the, um, let's say the first results that I found from the survey that I conducted um, earlier this year. So that's what was being sold, right, in the abstract if you go to a TripF website. I uh, said that I would identify the socio-technical requirements for the establishment of community-driven initiatives, such, such as this one, and exploring how the implementation of TripF has progressed within um, cultural heritage institutions and the potential of the framework in relation to scientific movements, such as citizen science, open science, and principles, um, fair data principles, but also the care principles for uh, indigenous care um, data governance, sorry. But this is what you will get. Um, the first part, um, this is what I call the socio-technical socio assemblage. And I'm going to see to it, trip IF, um, in relation to linked art, which is in, um, an RDF application of Psydoc CRM um, using JSON-LD and Getty vocabularies. Um, uh, but it's also a working group of Psydoc and a dedicated and, and community. I also see to it, trip IF in terms of um, Yes, yeah, so fair, care, open science, and citizen science. So I'm not going to explore the implementation of TripF in the cultural heritage now, but that's something you can get in one and a half years, I guess. So some context first. Uh, that's the title, the full title of my um, thesis, Linked Open Usable Data for Cultural Heritage. And I'm looking into two perspectives. One uh, around community practices. So I'm very much interested in individuals and all the other entities or actors, so non-human entities as well within those communities, as well as the semantic interoperability layer, um, whether it's at the syntax level or the layer of um, really what kind of inf informational knowledge is shared through these APIs. And this is some of the methodology that is relevant to that slide is first I'd like to situate linked open usable data, doing systematic literature review, interviews, and the most important part for TripF and linked art is to analyze primary, what I call primary data, so the GitHub issues and call minutes that actually a uh, lot of them are created each week. Some observations, so for example, how do we do consensus building into, so now there is a good use case, which is around 3D and um, the future of, I mean, the future release of a presentation API 4. And last but not least, the survey, which I called characterizing the TripF and linked art communities. Maybe, maybe some of you did complete it, hopefully. And something that I want to share, even if that's maybe not that important for TripF, it's important to me, it's one of the epistemological foundations of my thesis, uh, which is around actor nectar theory, which was m mainly defined by Bruno Latour, um, which aims to describe the very nature of societies, but to do so, it does not limit itself to human individual, but extend the word actor or actant to non-human, non-individual entities. So I'd like to recognize that non-humans have agency. Uh, I'm not, right, it's not about, oh, is Chad GPT an agent? I don't care about that, actually. It's more about, all the um, things that are characterized within a community and all the dependencies that we have within each other. So assembling the collective in terms of the intermediaries and mediators that we have within each actor and actors. And then the translation process is naming those is association and the traceable associations that can be found within. So, oh yeah, and all the images, maybe you may wonder why I have those, uh, they are um, it's in the context of my PhD thesis, it's funded um, and part of a project that uses 
pictures from the Swiss Society for Focal Studies. And here you have a, well, a lovely cat. We don't know the date, we don't know where it was, but it's here with me at all presentation. Um, um, that's a slide and that's a picture that Josh already showed you, that we know, that's the last time where it was also out in Göttingen. And I'm very much interested in this rather than at the institutional level, because that's what I think quite interesting about IIIF is that you, when you start conversing with other people, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do in your institution, but if you bring value into the community, your name do not matter anymore. And what matters is what you do as an individual. Oh, and that's a slide that is not here. I think it's just charging. Wait a minute. There is no internet. So, I'm sorry, but actually, I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> So I can talk while I'm loading the presentation, which is working here. So slide 10, yeah. So this slide is about all the, uh, let's do that like this. Uh, thank you, Josh. So I tried last year to, into within one diagram, to find all the formal entities, right? Not something that at the truth, oh, it's still not up. Bear with me, it's going to be amazing. At some point. Here we go. Lot of information here. I hope you still you're still with me. Um, basically, what I want to show here is is not only about call minutes and events, but all the things that you can do within the TripF community. And it's you may you look like a huge machine, but actually it's pretty well I think suited. What what what's but what is important also to highlight, even if you have all these kinds of well the editors, the calling thing committee, and so on. Um, what I'm trying also to find out and to explore and my hypothesis is we are maybe a big community, I mean a lot of people, but actually not so many people are actually within all these groups and interact with each other. And that's something that I think as a community we need to reflect on. So in my survey that was um, launched on the 24th of March and that ended on 7th of May, I was interested in all the individual involved in either communities, but also people that have heard of the specifications of the community uh, without being maybe, maybe they're not involved in it, or maybe they think they're not involved in it. That's another uh, part of the survey. Um, eight sections, so only the ones in green, every, um, was they, they were monetary, and then afterwards you could see um, how it branched. So basically either TripWire for linked art, TripWire and linked art, so the parallels between two communities, um, TripWire itself, linked art, all the people that are not involved. So a report will be published soon. Uh, what I'm going to show you is just a glimpse. And who participated? About 70, uh, sorry, not about, 79 percent from 20 countries. Um, something also that I found quite interesting and quite representative of who we are, 66 individuals with at least a master's degree. Um, 52 people that were involved either in TripWive or in both communities, so LinkedIn and TripWive. 
more so them being quite representative, but 50 males and 26 females and other people that did not say or did, didn't want to say how they their gender identification. And 33 people working in clan institution, 26 in academia. And that's also two things, I guess, here to understand. The X um, thing, so the personal ID is not that important, but that's, that was the only way for me as a scatter blocks to show you the engagement in different calls. So either it's the community call or the technical calls and so on. And the year when the, since when they started to be involved. And the bigger they are, the dots, the bigger they are engaged in the calls over the past year, right? Not over the past 10 years, otherwise it doesn't make that much sense. And something that we see here, there are two things. The first of all, how, I mean, when do you think Troop have started? That's already one um, question and answer. 2011, beforehand. And the second thing is prior to 2021, the engagement, the very active engagement is scarce in the community. Some of the practices, I tried to do something like the graph before, but I didn't have time to do that. Uh, most people just mentioned that they would use heavily Slack, the website, and GitHub as their main endpoint, but that would be the most people that identify also as technical people, even if I didn't um, ask for what they were doing. Um, and also something that we don't have, um, we can't really trace that, but it's the collaboration outside the Troop Life community, um, if you think in terms of um, other people, and uh, so not within the official uh, channels, I guess. What is quite successful or enables people to make it to Troop Life is that it's quite inclusive, there is a collaborative nature, the APIs, it's a plus, compatible implementation, openness and friendliness, and commitment to providing resources and reducing needs. What is more difficult and is a barrier is, well, time constraint for participants, technical complexity, and other two things, but I guess, I mean, the first two, I think, has been around for quite some time, but the, the, the number three and number four is, I guess, the um, very important to address is the high cost of in-person meetings and the lack of on-site support and recognition of community work. And I think we heard that um, for the work, for example, of the, the 3D work and before for the AV work to make it a standard, you can make as many online calls as you want. At some point, you need face-to-face -face meetings to make things I mean, go faster. Um, and trip IF to movement in principle. So basically, the, um, let's say the winner in terms of movement would be citizen science. In terms of open science, it was maybe, yeah, a little bit more than the so 30 people that agreed or strongly agreed that it was actually quite essential to use Trooper for open science or that open science and Trooper were related. And then with the fair, without surprise, interoperability and reusability as are like the two biggest factor, but findability is really um, the number one issue in terms of fair, uh, it's not for, for the moment. It's You can't say that it's, you have the full fair package if you just use Drupal IF, but Drupal IF is not only about interoperability, right? And then something quite unknown to some people, but it's also, those surveys are also here to raise awareness that care is great, but actually, uh, fair is great, but it's not, yeah, it's, I'm not going to say what I think about fair, but care principles is something you should look at. Really, it's it's like care with fair and actually with people in mind, with people, so indigenous people in mind, and I think that's where the committee should go, in my opinion. And it's not yet very recognized and we don't know, but I think TripF as a mediator, maybe not the technology itself in terms of his API, but in terms of the things that you can say with it, that you can transmit, can be really, um, so care could be cr quite critical. And you may not know about LinkedIn. That's another good point here to raise awareness. But both communities prioritize usable linked data or linked up and usable data. Um, common individual play important roles in both initiatives. They collaborate on standards, development and meetings, fostering culture of community late work. And finally, um, well, TropeF has expanded into various domains, not only cultural heritage, even if we saw with the earlier slide that it's still very much, and we can see here in this row, very much glam and academia.
focus. Um, and LinkedIn remains, yeah, for the moment, very much for museum, but it's maybe going to change. Some takeaways, and I tried to address those takeaways in terms of the strategic framework that was actually done last, presented last year at the online meeting in December. So there are four pillars. And well, for the advocacy leadership, it's quite hard to say anything about the survey that I did. But in terms of technical development, um, I haven't really talked about that, but also had a list of tools that people were using. And I think what Glenn showed yesterday, that's this survey has the same kind of results that viewers such as Mirador and UV have very much heavily used. And yeah, with an increasing number of individual depending on those software so you need to maintain them and that's absolutely vital. So even if we're not the primary people to do that, I think we need to help them in some way. Community development, um, and that's what you saw with the scout block, growing and evolving. Um, I remember joining Trip by F in 2016 with 150 people, I think, on Slack or something like that. I don't know what's the number now, but 1,000. Um, and some long-standing members remain involved, very involved. Uh, I think the, the issue that we have is really to make people involved with technical specification groups. In terms of membership of value, I think that's the number one thing to be addressed um, Yeah, in terms of cost with in-person meetings. And that's another thing that I also had personally, the inadequate employee support and engaging the TrueBev community and what's the value of it. And I think in terms of outreach, um, I hope those booklets will flourish so we are better equipped to say why TrueBev is important because you may know the value, you may want to explain it, but then the message needs to get across. So some image credits and thank you very much for your attention in two different writing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Julian. <coughs> Excuse me. We have time um, for a question if anybody wants to uh, prompt Julian to reflect on something or another. Hold on. Thanks very much, Julian. In terms of uh, outreach and uh, exercise some of the care principles. Did you find some follow-up to the surveys since you had that open for a while? Did that open up engagement and spread the good news? Hmm. Uh, difficult to say. I'm still digging up the results, I must say. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, my, my survey was not a an outreach effort, even if I knew that some of the results would be, we have recommendation for outreach, I guess. Um, and I, yeah, I have nothing to say. I, I mean, I, I just have suggestion, I guess, at that level now. Um, and that's what you saw is really much the, the, community, uh, the community practices um, for my thesis, but then the other hand would be more technical. I, yeah, I think I may, in the report, I, I think I'll be m more, yeah, there will be more information about that and what should be done at some level, but then is the committee has to decide. <laughs> Hi, Julian. Thanks for the great presentation. I really loved it. Um, I was wondering what your initial suggestion would be uh, based on some of your research for the AAAF community or AAAF to move more towards the care principles. Because hmm. uh, I really like that suggestion. I think you need to see AAAF as a, what I call a full mediator, which means it's not only, oh, it's great, we have Zoom. Yeah, I mean, if it is just for Zoom, there are other good technologies to use. You don't need TripF. TripF is just nice because it's now it's quite cheap to use it, actually. I, even if, well, if you want some, you have a lot of images, a bit maybe more complicated, but the, I think you need to think it in terms of how you structure your all infrastructure and not only just as a piece of technology. Uh, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing, we are here community, and well, there are people from different 
institutions, even if mostly uh, we are based in North America and Europe. And I think that's one of the things that needs to be addressed is like how to reach to other groups um, and see what they are, what the needs are. That's one of the things. The other thing is Trooper works very well with other JSON LD APIs, and I think that's one of the hypotheses of my <laughs> thesis. Uh, and through that, you could actually do some very good semantic interoperability. That's not the, the, the so semantic is not for TripF, but how to link that to TripF, how to explain what the TripF manifest is through different APIs such as LinkedArt is actually something that could be a good thing and could be linked to address some of the care principles needs. Uh, great. And next, I'd like to welcome Elena P. U. Um, to talk about the uh, AAAF and the Swiss National Swiss Federal Archive. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I will present you the the implementation of AAAF at the Swiss Federal Archives. The Swiss Federal Archives preserve the documents of the Swiss Confederation. For example, those of the Federal Assembly, the Federal Council, or the Federal Administration. Uh, the access to and the consultation of records by researcher and the public is a cornerstone of uh, our legal mandate. The files are currently digitized on demand, and until recently, customers received a zip file to download. We wanted to offer our clients a more user-friendly digital consultation tool, and this is where IIIF comes in. But the Swiss Federal Archives did not want to make a big jump into IIIF and preferred a step-by-step -step approach. Why? Because in 2018, when we began to consider implementing IIIF, very few uses of IIIF in the archival domain were known Considering the risks uh, that this represented, as well as the budget, we preferred a small step approach. So I will uh, present you this small step approach and uh, some challenges we faced, uh, practical effect uh, for the development and a little live demo. Um, IIIF was considered for the first time in some detail in the spring 2018 within the context of a project for a new online access. One question was the way of how the file should be delivered to the users. We evaluated the various options and one of these options was uh, IIIF. IIIF was considered as very promising for the future, however, after considering the framework conditions at the time, we didn't opt for IIIF. The budget and the time schedule did not allow for the necessary conceptual work. Among others, IIIF would have required a change of the overall IT architecture, which was out of the, sc of the scope for the present project. But IIIF was now definitely on the agenda. The Swiss Federal Archives continued its journey toward the implementation of IIIF in the following year. In the first step, we wanted to integrate IIIF in uh, Alt Transit Portal. This is a website we had published online in 2018 in order to document the making of the new rail link through the Alps, notably the largest transport project Switzerland has seen for decades. For this, we could benefit from the preceding work of the Swiss Social Archives and the Netherlands International Institute for Social History. These two institutes collaboratively developed archival IIIF. In exchange with the Swiss Social Archives, we could put online our first IIIF presentation of archival files in 2020. This was meant to be a limited pilot, which would help us to deepen our understanding of IIIF and to build a practical experience of its implementation in our organizational setting. The next step was more ambitious. In 2021, 
We started a project that aimed at presenting the minutes of the Federal Council with IIIF. The website uh, includes more than 14,000 minutes of decision. It comprises both handwritten minutes and typewritten minutes in a period from 1848 to 1963. The text of the handwritten minutes are mainly written in the old German cursive script, which is no longer in use and not very well known today. Um, it had been extracted by uh, AI powered text recognition of handwritten documents in an earlier cooperative project with the Walter Benjamin College Digital Humanities at the University of Bern using the transcribus technology from the European Initiative RedCoop that we also heard uh, today. The challenge here was to find a way to pre how, to of how to present the original cursive script in parallel with the extracted text. Uh, with this, we could not rely on existing example of IIIF, but had to find a new innovative solution for this specific requirement. Later, we added a simple correction function uh, to the IIIF interface which allows the users to suggest correction when they notice any error in the extracted OCR text. Now, the minute from uh, 1964 onwards will be successively published on the website. The next step leads us back to the online access. Uh, that means the integration of IIIF into the overall access infrastructure of the Swiss Federal Archives. This was a huge step. We wanted to make files consultation easier with IIIF. We faced a number of challenges. I will come back to them in a few minutes. Uh, but this implementation offers our customer a greater consulting comfort and new possibilities. First, you don't need to have a user account and login anymore to consult the files uh, accessible with IIIF. Second, you don't need to download the file to consult it the file can be accessed uh, directly. And third, you can download the OCR. We faced uh, some challenges such as legal framework, multilingualism, and archival standards. Actually, the Federal Act on Archiving imposes some restriction. In general, the records become available after 30 years. But for the personal data, the retention period is 50 years. With the Mirador search tool, it is possible to systematically search for potential personal data. In order to confirm the law, we have therefore restricted the access uh, to record with IIIF to the expiration uh, of a 50-year period. So only digitized, freely accessible files that are more than 50 years old can be consulted with IIIF but that's still 47,000 files. Another challenge has arisen with IIIF, multilingualism. Switzerland has four national languages, German, French, Italian, and uh, retro romansh With the exception of retro romansh these are official languages, which means that a citizen can address the administration in German, French, or Italian. The websites of the Confederation must be translated into uh, all three languages. We also uh, have many international customers, so it was necessary to translate into English as well. This particularity created some difficulties. For example, it is not possible in the IIIF environment to integrate links to websites in different languages. Another challenge was to integrate the IIIF infrastructure in the Technical Archival Standard OAIS. We needed a particular infrastructure for that with an image server. It was not possible to take the images from our archival server, um, so we registered them into, uh, in, a, in, in an image server, this, and this solution is more expensive. We also had to deal with the Swiss e-government standards, and all these standards express requirements, sometimes intentions, 
and we had to be satisfied as best as possible. The practical effects of the implementation of IIIF can be seen in two areas uh, for the users and for the Swiss Federal Archives. For the users, as I said, a uh, customer can consult files directly and easily. They also no longer need to create an account. They can benefit from the possibilities offered by IIIF, especially the interoperability. For the Swiss Federal Archives, this implementation has various practical effects, such as a new process, for example, the synchronization of primary data and an additional OCR process, new costs, and a more complex online access. Being part of IIIF community is also new. We had some difficulties with the synchronization of primary data. It takes a long time to synchronize and the implementation of IIIF is uh, recent, so don't be surprised if you are searching some files in our online access and only and you only encounter a few examples right now. It's coming. So IIIF has been implemented recently, as I said, um, but we already have a list of developing features such as the text uh, search in all the online access, a double page display, the annotation within the resource, etc. An important aspect is also the integration of further file formats into IIIF, such as videos and audio files. Uh, we are thinking about a less expensive solution for the image storage, which means a new architecture too. The question of implementing IIIF for the records in retention period, accessible uh, for authorized person only, is another possibility that we would like to consider. And the cooperation within the IIIF community is also a perspective for us. Um, as a conclusion, I will do a little live demo, hoping everything goes well. So that's the minutes of the Federal Council. Uh, you can do a search or advanced search, uh, but, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Did I have a Wi-Fi problem? Ah, yeah, it's coming. So you can just choose, uh, for example, I'm just waiting that it comes. Normally, not do not take so much time, but. Um. I don't know why. Yeah, I think. Oh, perfect. Ta-da. Um, so you have here the um, original documents and here the uh, OCR text with uh, transcribers because sometimes it can be difficult. You can just, when you want to check in the original documents and just don't understand what is written here, you can just click and have the, the answer. Um, 
and if you have the type written um, uh, minutes, you can also hide your serial with type written. It's not uh, so uh, useful. But you can also here download and have the access to the direct uh, with the reference code to the online access. If you just want to know where is it, uh, or what is it for documents. <laughs> but you also have uh, obviously the the, the different uh, uh, reference or uh, reference codes, title, date, uh, and so on. Sorry, do you have? Any question? Thank you for uh, your presentation, very interesting, especially uh, for me that I'm interested in, in the archival domain. And in this regard, my question is uh, about the archival perspective. So have you uh, think about uh, or implemented also uh, a structure to uh, express uh, as well as possible the uh, archival distinction in uh, uh, classes, uh, uh, files and records? Um, so it's already on the online access, uh, maybe, oops, if there is, it, it does exist la still a lot of time, well, you cannot see it, but in the online access uh, before IIIF, long before IIIF, you have all the, the class, class in the plan, the archival plan, and you can just show the different structure and different, uh, yeah, fonts, files. Um, so that that's not really um, uh, new with IIIF, it's more. Um, I know because when you go to the to the you, to the connection to IIIF to the files, you already have s shown the um, the plan. So we don't integrate it in the IIIF environment. Other questions? All right, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, up next, I'm happy to welcome Emilia De Bernardo and Rosemary Leone. Um, talking about multimodal cross-domain approaches using IIIF. Okay, um, I'm Emilia Di Bernardo. I'm the founder of DBSeret, and uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, she's uh, Rosemary Leone from European Space Agency. She's uh, the IT strategy. Uh, officer and uh, with this presentation I'd like to share our experiences in cross-domain approaches using IIIF. Uh, first let me briefly introduce our company just a few sentences uh, we has been an associate member of IIIF consortium since 2020. Our company has been providing uh, IIIF technology to libraries, archives and museums uh, to support digital humanities and uh, we have uh, recently implemented for uh, Regione Sardegna, Region Sardinia, Fontus, a digital asset management uh, integrated uh, with uh, the regional system to disseminate uh, for, access for accessing cultural information resources. The project is still ongoing. I, prom I promise to Regione Sardegna that the project is still ongoing, but we are just standing, I think, uh, next month. The digital and data ecosystem of Sardinia region is structured in three macro components, Fontus, the, our digital asset management, uh, which is able to interact uh, with the meta engine and, will, and with uh, the Sardinia cultural portal. 
Fontus consists of a web application and a pipeline jointly allowing users to manage the different stages from ingestion to disseminating the digital assets. At the same time, Fontus provides uh, the portal with mirador and universal views uh, for digital resources uh, via AAA. The request was for the dam itself, uh, as well as the ingestion service for the existing digital assets uh, with the related metadata. Uh, here you have different types uh, of contents uh, and uh, the number of files and assets that you ingested. The type and the provenance and the semantic content of digital object is uh, hybrid and uh, it varies for the different projects that you can see here. And uh, for just one example, corpora of uh, Antichità della Sardegna, corpora of uh, Antiquities of Sardinia is just an example and provide a broad and updated overview of the artistic and artisanal production of the civilization of settlers on the island over time. At the same time, it enriches the database of the regional catalog before describing the main features of Fontus and the cooperation of IIIF, I would like to introduce you a short video. And okay. they are very beautiful digital objects from Sardinia.
so you have seen the main features on Pontus of our young, dear young. Uh, just few, I, I have to mention that we have management of master and ancillary files of each asset and the AAAF compliance, which implies smart access to images by using AAAF viewer, examination and comparison of the images, sharing annotations, integrated viewers for audio and video, and uh, VR, 360 images and 3D objects. In a nutshell, this is our infrastructure, and uh, we have two virtual machines that interact with Amazon S3 services for storage and other Amazon services to perform batching operations. The VM1 is the only machine exposed on the internet, and uh, the VM2 is uh, within a private network. And here you can see the various formats supported for the Sardinia project. Working with Pontus uh, first involves the ingestion of digital files. So the job file in JSON format describes metadata and resource files to be loaded in a specified asset. The job file essentially consists of two main sections named param uh, job params containing the general parameters and asset containing only information assets. The asset is always structured in iris parts. There must be at least one part treated as main on root. And uh, the value, sorry, okay. And uh, the value struct part define the logical position of the part relative to the asset structure. Visibility is uh, uh, we implemented three, le three levels of visibility, public, private, uh, and uh, hidden for security reason, and to, to hidden contents that, uh, mm, that administrator, administrator doesn't want to, to public uh, on uh, the internet. The files must be simply copied into a specific ingestion, and uh, the other is class name for different classes and metadata. Here so you see the Dublin Core uh, terms. And uh, here is an example of job. You are simply copy into a folder the assets that you want uh, to upload or import. The difference is uh, upload is uh, asset per asset, import is a massive uh, uploading. The metadata assigned to each asset is defined using elements specified in the vocabularies. Each uh, vocabulary set in fontus can define entities of type, property, or class. Properties can be assigned to an asset using the templates, the classes, Conversely, are used to specify the type of assets, even software and data sets. Each model is tied to a specific class and representation of metadata profiles. I'm sorry, I have some. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is uh, the taxonomy that represents a tree with the, which the assets are inserted. On the authorized user can modify this tree, but very interesting function is that you can move entire nodes and all the connected uh, images and assets uh, to other position, create sub nodes, uh, rename nodes, uh, and so on. So it's a dynamic uh, uh, tree. The hierarchical classification consists in defining relations of inheritance and derivation between concepts. The DAM platform is made of five components uh, that interact with each other according to the scheme that you can see here. The AAAF image server is an essential element of uh, the architecture si since it deals with generating derivative uh, images uh, on demand. It allows drop, cropping, uh, resizing, uh, rotating, uh, and formal conversion 
format conversion going to support image viewer with deep zoom and panning uh, capabilities. All these features are done on the fly, including thumbnail generation. Compliance with the IIIF image API allows the this component to work uh, with increasingly more web-oriented uh, IIIF client application. Each application environment uh, in which Pontus is structured is equipped with advanced search functions. You can discover the related contents uh, and IIIF enabled materials belonging to the cultural heritage of Sardinia regions, thanks to the generation of IIIF manifest in Pontus. This is uh, crucial for asset search, uh, in which user can discover, associate uh, descriptive metadata and annotation, as well as find IIIF manifest uh, URLs. Annotation written by anonymous user, the, um, an authenticated user, can be approved by moderators, and we have a workflow of approval for uh, uh, the annotations before to public. The annotation are stored in Pontus for each of, mm, of the following. Uh, we store text, tags, uh, shape area, color area, and uh, so on. Concluding the DM application scenario, users' activity are tracked for the system in application log available by web interface. Uh, here you have uh, all the list of activities, activities that we track. Uh, and uh, for each event, uh, the system tracks uh, user IP address uh, and uh, messages and so on. The platform can be used in a software as a service and on premises. Uh, okay. Thanks for your attention. And uh, I give the floor to Mary Leone from uh, ISA. Hi, okay, fine. Um, yes, my name is Rosemary Leone. I'm working for the European Space Agency. I'm working in space since 35 years now for the uh, space directorate, I mean the one that are developing satellites. So I can imagine that you're asking yourself, what is this UFO <laughs> doing here? So I will bring you through uh, how ESA is applying Tripoli IF and the entire end-to-end -end architecture with respect to uh, acquiring and digitalizing image, archiving image for the, I mean, preserving them and then disseminating them to the Tripoli IF platform. And I will also show you uh, the use case scenario for the digital curation of our images. Um, I invite, I will not give a demo <laughs> because I'm worried that it's not working. <laughs> So I really invite you to go. I don't know if you can confirm that you can access this because there you will see a complete Triple IEF compliant uh, solution that we are adopting for our images, photo images at the moment. Um, I wanted to tell you a few words on how do we arrive to uh, Tripoli IF before we start. So I was trying to see how can I summarize this path. <laughs> I mean, on one side it was because of a challenge and then because of an opportunity, but also because of the vision. The challenge for us was I was uh, 10 years working for the long-term data preservation of heritage mission program that during one of our conference, uh, one young person asked me, oh, uh, if I need to preserve your da my data, I will come to ESA because your safe is for sure a safe uh, that is viable and uh, I'm sure that the data are protected there. What he meant actually was that he could not access our data. So we start thinking that we should not only preserve the data, but also make them available to the general public in a fair way. And I saw in the previous presentation that you were talking about the fair principle. So this was why we started not to look only to the preservation aspect of our data. When I talk about our data, I initially uh, was working with the for example, with the Earth observation data, which are the data that we need to preserve because this data represent our climate and our the healthiness of the Earth. 
So um, what we started was to focus on the preservation of the data, on disseminating the data in a fair, according to the FAIR principle, but then uh, we realized that general public and student also needed the documentation and images that were representing the entire development phase of a mission. For example, photo, videos collected from space engineer, CAD model, and everything that we had in our archive. And this is where we started, together with Didi Zaret, uh, to digitalize images in our archives and this image represent more than, as is said here, 200,000 negatives and printed image. Uh, from ASRO and ALDO, ASRO and ALDO represent the Space Center and the Lone Trust Center before the merging into the European Space Agency. So one first issue was the challenge of making our data and our information asset digital, ob not, not yet digital object, but all the object that represents ESA knowledge and the European member states knowledge available to the public and preserving it for the long term. Um, the second challenge that we had was also uh, to make this information available to the public and annotated. And this was an issue because we realized that we only had all this beautiful photo, but nobody except the uh, pensioner or staff that were already on mission since here were able to identify people there or identify the instrument uh, or associating an event. For example, I don't know if you can already see our solution in the web, but you will see, you see the contact sheet with all people attending events. So what we did was, thanks to Didi Saret, that was bringing us in the world <laughs> of the Tripoli AF to adapt the Tripoli AF environment for the curation, the digital curation of these images. So what we did, it might appear a little bit easy, but we involved pensioner, all is around stuff, and people that were at home, and we used Tripoli AF to annotate all these images. It was not easy, as somebody was, I mean, was, uh, was also telling here in the previous presentation, but uh, we had to train those people, but they were really very, very good in identifying the people, the instrument, and all the information on this photo. We had to do the same. I mean, it's not that ESA can publish everything. We have copyrights, we have intellectual property rights, we had data protection issue, information security issue, but uh, at least a certain, I must say, 20, 30% of this information could be uh, open to the public, and this is what we did through our uh, environment developed by Didi Saret. Um, the project started with the digitization of all the negatives there. Uh, we had to do a sound assessment of what could really go to the public uh, and what should stay internally, but both environment, I mean the one that is exposed to the web through the possibility of our digital asset management system developed by DBSR to uh, define what are the visibility of this object. We can have objects that are uh, praised to be uh, published outside and objects that have to be digitally curated and, in, um, and uh, evaluated inside. So this is uh, also a very good opportunity that we have with this solution. Uh, so, at the moment, as you have seen, uh, we are providing access to the digital object there. And, uh, but it's much, much more, I can tell you. And there are beautiful, beautiful photos, very old photos that are now going to be upraised according to, I uh, saw so some um, were talking about the retention schedule. We have sometimes to wait 34 years before downgrading the visibility level, or in our case, the security marking. And this is something that is we're going today in our archive. This is what you will find. This is our um, Space Heritage Image Project. 
at the moment you will see, I don't know if you, I hope you will be able to connect in the future, you see that all the metadata are based on the doubling core and you have the possibility here to curate and annotate because this is, was very much important for us uh, and to provide uh, information about the images and this is not, I must say, the best one, but <laughs> there are other images where we really have to recognize the design, the instrument, the establishment, the launch site, and the people. What uh, DB Saret was already presented, Emilia was presenting, is already that whenever there is the digital curation and we have the annotation from pensioner or ESA staff pensioner or from the outside world, uh, this digital curation can be annotated, can be validated by our archivist, and we are then preserving, and this is, I think, the most important aspect, this as an annotation in the preservation format, in the archival information package for those of you that are used to OIS and the CCHDS standards, uh, will realize that we close the cycle between having an image published, commented, annotated, and then all the annotation is evaluated for preservation and to be ingested into the archive. Finto. <laughs> Okay, but I wanted two seconds, don't make questions, because this was important. I didn't manage to finish. The challenge was for me uh, to assure the entire end-to-end -end life cycle, so to have the creation. The opportunity, what was important also, another challenge was the interoperability between space agency, because each of the space agency has the same historical archive of the mission. I think this was also important, but the vision this was something that I was impressed by the Vatican Library because the vision was to bridge between humanistic si and scientific science application. And I was thinking to the supernova. The supernova has been, there is a type of supernova that has been sensed by Abo there. But in the Medioevo, in the Middle Age, it, the same type of supernova has been painted because it was 23 days there in the stars, and we have the beautiful image in the Vatican. So this was the vision that gave rise to all this. <laughs> okay, no question. All right, thank you both. Um, that is a wonderful metaphor to, uh, yeah, to just reflect on IIIF bridging the gap among so many different domains. Um, all right, we are. I'm going to move to our last presentation before the lightning talks. Um, so let me, I have uh, the ESA site on my phone. Here we go, now I have the schedule. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Clarice Bardio, Jacob Hart, David Bouquet, and Anthony Gourjean um, to talk about memory call, uh, developing a Mirador extension supporting video annotation. Hello everybody, um, thanks for having us here in Naples. So this is our first time at the uh, IIIF conference and we've really enjoyed uh, meeting the community over the last couple of days. And now I'm excited to present to you some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of months that notably takes the form of an extension to Mirador uh, that supports video and audio annotation and the construction and navigation of manifest networks. So you see there's also GR code there up on the screen uh, that links to the slides of these presentations. So if you want to get to them, then uh, you can use that. Um, so very quickly, I'll begin by explaining the context of this project uh, as it prolongs a research project that's been going on since about 2015, uh, notably around the development of a tool for video annotation, which is called Memo Recall. Uh, that emerged in a context of the scenic arts, um, but is now used in a diverse range of contexts uh, by users ranging from school children to um, researchers. 
So very quickly, uh, just presenting some of the people working on the project. So first there's Clarisse Bardiot, uh, who's sitting in the audience just there, uh, at University of Rennes 2. Uh, so she started and has been leading this project since 2015. Uh, there's also my colleague David Rouquier, who will be talking in just a moment, who's from Tetra Libre, uh, the development team behind Memory Call and the work we shall be presenting today. And there's me, uh, Jacob Hart, I'm currently on a two-year postdoc on the project until around January 2025. Um, and there's a number of other people that have worked on the project over the years across various workshops and research projects that um, I won't have time to go over fully. Um, and of course, over the years, we've collected a number of institutional partners, uh, a few of them you can see here, uh, notably the COZO project, uh, which I shall come back to uh, shortly. So Memo Recall, what is it? Um, it's a free and open source uh, web app that allows you to take a main video resource that is either on YouTube or Vimeo um, and annotate it in various ways, uh, notably linking annotations to um, different types of documents. So uh, they can be other videos, images, audio documents, uh, and the arrangement of these documents creates what we call a capsule uh, which is a new document that can be shared or embedded anywhere online. Um, so this web app is uh, available on our website. You can create uh, an account today and start using it if you need to. All the links will be shown at the end of the presentation. Um, it's got a very strong user base. There's uh, been over 3,000 capsules that have been created uh, to date. Um, and as I mentioned before, thanks to its uh, simple interface but powerful features, uh, it gets used in a variety of contexts by many different types of users. Um, so from researchers, artists, cultural institutions, teachers, students, cultural mediators, uh, etc. However, um, today I'm going to be talking about the work um, that we've been doing to create a new version of the tool, uh, which is notably based entirely around uh, IIIF. Um, and to do that, uh, I shall hand over to David, who will be talking about uh, some of the technical work that's occurred. And then a bit later, I'll take you through um, some concrete examples of content and usage that has been made with our prototype, um, which are also live um, and that you'll be able to check out online. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks for having us. Uh, so, um, without getting technical at all, uh, I will uh, get through the, the steps uh, that we had uh, to made a, make a proof of concept of uh, whether it was possible or not to re-implement uh, memory call in uh, using IIIF technologies. Uh, first, you didn't mention it, uh, Jacob, why would we want to, to re-implement uh, the legacy uh, memory call in the first place? Uh, well, two main uh, two, two key points uh, are that we wanted to enforce uh, interoper interoperability, uh, and then also in uh, the legacy platform, the video is really the, the central piece. I mean, you're here to annotate a video. Uh, but we wanted, okay, maybe if I follow the image annotating the video, maybe it becomes my main point on attention, and, and, and I can start working on the image, annotate it, and so on. So uh, IIIF seemed a, a, good, uh, a good place uh, to, to do that. Uh, so there are four main uh, actions that we, we performed. So I will not go through them here. Uh, there are four slides for that. Uh, so first, uh, we had attention on uh, Miador that uh, seemed to do a pretty good job at uh, rendering uh, content. So we started from here, but uh, it didn't have video playback. Uh, so even though uh, it's now, I mean, audio and video are now in IIIF standard, uh, it wasn't implemented uh, in Mirador. Uh, so fortunately, uh, some work already uh, existed around that, and uh, we built upon a, a fork from Mirador uh, by Tokyo University uh, that does not seem to be maintained anymore, but so we took it, uh, we uh, upgraded it so it it works with uh, the, the latest version of Mirador, um, made a bit of debugging, and uh, okay, we had the video playback, so this was quite easy. Um, and so we had the chance here to, to meet with uh, the community uh, developing Mirador, and I think that we, we can move forward to, to maybe merge this video playback capacities uh, in, in the main project, we will see. 
Um, ah, one uh, side note here, uh, we have a use case that uh, people want to annotate a video already accessible online and yeah, mainly maybe YouTube, maybe PeerTube. So I think that we will uh, allow that even if it's not really compliant with the standard, but maybe if in a canvas the target is a YouTube video or anything, uh, we plan to, to, to render it, yeah, maybe, uh, I mean to have a fallback so it just works. Uh, then, what I call nested manifest annotation, uh, I don't know, I think I wanted to sound clever saying that, but uh, it, it's a bit dumb. Uh, so it's, and furthermore, the, the sentence behind is just a bit wrong. Uh, it's actually manifests annotating canvases in other manifests. So th this is the correct way, I think, to, to put it. Uh, so this is possible in the standard, but we didn't see so many examples of it. Um, and it wasn't possible to, to render it in Mirador because, uh, okay, if you have uh, your, your canvas, a video, an image, anything, uh, you annotate it with a manifest, maybe containing an image, a canvas con uh, pointing to an image, uh, you have to render kind of a preview because uh, the, the manifest that is used as an annotation, maybe is itself annotated and so on. So uh, you need to, to, to render kind of a preview. But what's, it, what's, it, what's cool with that is that it creates a media network and then you can access your content by uh, browsing this media. And uh, Jacob will show uh, how it, uh, it's now possible in Mirador. Uh, next step, so we wanted user to be able to edit the, the annotations on, uh, on video. So again, we looked uh, at what, what was available. And uh, in the project Mirador GitHub uh, group, uh, so there was a plugin, uh, again, that seemed a bit uh, deprecated, but so we started from there. And uh, so this is uh, the image from the, I mean, uh, the plugin that annotates images, so we modified it so it can annotate uh, videos. And uh, yeah, not, not, not so much of a job. Uh, last step, we need multi-user support, um, and uh, so we have a proof of concept, even if it's not online, it has not been used uh, right now. It's a Docker stack, uh, including a Mirador instance, uh, an annotation server for the persistency of the annotations, and a small Flask app uh, to manage user permissions to content, uh, sharing capabilities, and so on. But <laughs> we met uh, during the conference uh, with the people uh, behind uh, Madoc that uh, hosted a, a workshop on a Tuesday. Uh, and also the, the people uh, developing uh, Medoc, so it's uh, Digirati, and they have a pretty good um, multi-user stack, and it seems it could work with Mirador, so maybe we should, uh, we should start from there, and that's one of the very nice thing, having a community that is uh, committed towards uh, open source and so on. And I will hand back to Jacob for uh, uh, some um, demos and so on. Thanks, David. Um, so now that David's explained the work uh, that we've achieved from a technical point of view, um, I should give you an illustration of the prototype in action uh, through some of the uses we've made. Uh, so I'll go over some of the key features and finish by showing you a, uh, a video that demonstrates these elements in action. Um, so the examples that you're going to be seeing, as I said earlier, uh, are taken from a semantic analysis we performed around the Horizon 2020 COZO project that Memory Call was a part of. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate that even in uh, prototype form, uh, the tool could be used for real semantic analysis in a, in a research context. So first, as David explained, the primary aspect of the prototype was driven around video and video adaptation. So we've made the most of Mirador as an interactive video player, uh, notably with annotations that control the playback, uh, the playback of the main media resource. And we also made the most of annotations that draw um, highlighting shapes directly onto the Mirador window and images to explain what's going on. Uh, we'll see some examples of Laban notation, for example, which is a way of uh, notating dance, which uh, depicts um, the movements of dance students as they appear in the video. Um, 
So we started uh, with from our video annotation perspective, but we soon realized that the flexibility of IIIF and the Mirador viewer would allow us to move away from um, just a video annotation tool and move towards a tool for the composition and navigation of heterarchical networks. Um, so the user can retain the uh, main video-centric perspective of memory recall, uh, but now we propose an approach that can consider one video as being one point of entry into a heterarchical network of documents uh, amongst many others. Um, so here I just show uh, kind of the basic methodology that was used when creating some of the demo content, and it kind of synthesizes our, our theoretical approach. Um, so the user will start with a collection of documents that are quite disparate. Um, they can think of them as documents in an archive. Uh, then we add what we call intra-documentary uh, annotations to these documents, which gives them more context, explaining various parts, um, and creates a collection of centered networks. And finally, uh, the documents are linked amongst themselves, creating a kind of decentered network. Uh, rhizomatic structure that, that spills out um, that could be entered into from conceivably any point. And so Mirador, uh, coupled with our implementation of uh, manifest linked annotations, allows us to navigate this network in a cumulative, non-destructive manner um, with documents being opened and being viewed uh, simultaneously, which we'll see an example of in just a second. And finally, uh, we've also adapted the IIIF uh, annotation format to create uh, composite interactive network visualizations. So the method here is basically to create data-driven visualizations um, from data uh, derived from the documents in the network. So this can be done automatically or manually, um, and data can be derived from close distant reading techniques. Um, you can think of many different case studies. Uh, so we can create any kind of visualization from a traditional network graph, which we'll be seeing, to more bespoke interfaces that um, pertain to specific research projects, like uh, the compass um, mapping that's being shown here. And then we annotate these images, which uh, essentially renders them interactive and allows the user to, uh, to navigate the, the network. And going forward, one of the main goals in development will be to try and make this kind of approach uh, available to users that don't uh, necessarily have a technical background as well. Um, so we can have a look at all of this in action. So first of all, we've got uh, the video player uh, happening in Mirador. So all the kind of functionalities you could imagine. Here we've got an example of adding annotations. So all of this is online and live in our sandbox demo. So the link will be there in a second. So we've got um, different metadata for the annotations that we can set on the right there. And then we've got different types of annotations. So here we can have an image annotation. Uh, here we've got a uh, file annotation, so uh, annotations that are linked to a file that can be downloaded. So this is all functionality that, that came uh, directly from Memo Recall. Here we've got a uh, playback control with, uh, with the annotations. So you see the um, Laban notation on the bottom, which is depicting uh, what the students are doing. And uh, you can observe that when we click on the annotation, uh, jumps to the p place in the video that it's depicting, and so it's a very useful way of doing that. And here we have the manifest networks that I was talking about earlier, and we see that uh, Mirador detects when an, uh, an annotation has been linked to a manifest, so we can see that we can very kind of fluidly navigate these different um, networks of multimodal documents. Here we see that um, using the same collection of, of uh, documents, we can use different configurations of the network. And here we have some more bespoke driven uh, data uh, interfaces that were created programmatically. And finally here uh, we get a kind of idea of putting it all together and uh, what navigating one of these uh, data networks uh, could be like. Making use of the elastic view in Mirador, which uh, 
took me far too long to, to discover. <laughs> Okay, so to conclude, um, here's a timeline of, uh, of our project and what's to come. Uh, so you'll note that the project name is actually in brackets, and that's because we'll probably be changing the name at some point for various, uh, for various reasons, but uh, you'll still be able to keep up to date with our progress on the Memo Recall website. Uh, so as you can see, we've, up to, we've got up to this point where we've made this prototype, um, and it was important for us to get that done for coming to the IIIF conference. Um, and now we'll be beginning work on the pre-alpha version. Uh, you'll see also that from next year, uh, we're looking to integrate AI-driven analysis tools. Um, and we'll also be integrating the project into an ERC project uh, called Stage that will be uh, starting at REN2 uh, in, in January uh, that's being led by Clarisse uh, also. And you'll see also uh, that in February next year, uh, we're going to be hosting an international conference on annotation and digital uh, heritage. And the link to that uh, is just here if you want to check that out. Um, it, would be, it would be great for us to hear from you. Um, so we're really eager to get your thoughts. So we've uh, really enjoyed coming. We've uh, and we wanted to thank also the organisers who were really really helpful even before the conference, um, you know, making things run smoothly and getting us here. We've really really appreciated it, and we've really enjoyed um, talking with uh, lots of different people. It's been really great. So please um, feel free to check out all the links. Uh, so everything uh, is live up online. Uh, and again, you can find these slides online as well. And uh, yeah, we'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. We have a moment. There's one question before we dive into the lightning talks. Or we use the entire conference and the coffee break and others. Um, thank you. This is wonderful to thank see you. the AV development. And there are a lot of Mirador folks here who I'm sure would be happy to advise uh, on next steps for you. So thank you again.